Richard, uh, one of your earlier jobs in the industry was investor's representative at the Australian Film Commission. What sort of qualifications does an investor's representative need and what, the, what were your responsibilities? I don't know if that job still exists. At the time, the, um, <coughs> the Film Commission uh, were required to act as an investor's representative to protect the rights of investors who'd who'd uh, invested in productions that the AFC had gone into. Nobody working at the AFC at the time had knowledge of practical production. I'd worked as a production manager. I was the localiest person to do this. Some of the, some of the work was um, redu redundant, not the word, but, but covered work being done by people like the completion guarantor. But I was doing my best to protect the interests of the investors in terms of warning them um, you could find yourselves in, in trouble unless you take care of you know, uh, the potential for overages here or ensure that you get a, uh, a, a, a completion guarantee. It happened, it was rather selectively done. I did it uh, for six films. One was a big budget film, Cool and Gatter Gold. Two or three were telly movies and, and two were um, documentaries. Um, it required visiting the sets, talking to the investors. I, I found it enormously useful, in fact, because it was the earliest days of 10BA in terms of meeting people who were making a business of invest, who were making the new business of investing in Australian films at a time when people were falling over themselves to do this because the returns were so lucrative. I think people are may or may not be well aware that in the earliest days of 10BA investment there was 150% return offered to investors on their investment. A $10,000 investment could be written down as a $15,000 investment and 50% of your returns were tax-free, uh, tax which in effect meant you needed a return of 10% on your film to break even. and. Very, very few films don't return 10% of their budget, probably even fewer of them in those days when a big budget would have been a $2 million budget. Yeah. What were the major business issues in those days and how have they changed for Australian filmmaking? Once upon a time, and I worked on the first feature film of the, the new era, which was Barry McKenzie, that was very simple. The, the NAFDC put up all the money. Thereafter, it was only a slightly more difficult process to get a film financed if you had a, a script that could attract investors. If you could get a pre-sale to one of the three principal distributors, Greater Union, Village or Hoyts, if you get a pre-sale to television, and in later days when state corporations sprung up, if you could get money from a state body, you would have your film financed sometimes uh, this was something that often took only three or four months. And we're talking about earliest days of the in industry, days of films like um, The Removalists and Peterson and Alvin Purple. Films cost two hundred, three hundred thousand, a four hundred thousand dollar film was was a rather expensive one. Once upon a time, that's nineteen seventy nine, I think. Uh, my brilliant career at um, 900,000 was the most, uh, no it wasn't, uh, my, my, Jimmy Blacksmith at 1.2 million equaled the 1.2 million that had been spent on Eliza Fraser, the two most expensive films. They needed, of course, more investment. Uh, nowadays, uh, budgets are far too high to, and also there isn't the distribution um, Money's available to uh, to invest proportionately in films and and television stations rarely put up uh, any amount of money that would make a sizable hole in the budget. So newer ways have got to be found, have been found, uh, to cover the cost of films in the last few years. And as I'm sure you've you've noticed, people are taking miles miles longer to get their films financed. How has that impacted, uh, that span of time, we're talking about 35, 40 years, nearly 35 years, in that period your business has had to, your business being uh, Richard Brennan, but, yeah. but as the company that you established, your business has had to change. What were the things that you had to do to keep up with these changes in the business? Well, I was Richard Brennan uh, without having a company for the first six or seven years. But you've got to 
remember this is a time when <coughs> somebody earning $7,000 a year was doing fine and somebody earning $10,000 a year was doing very well. Um, from the earliest, or not from the earliest days, from about 1979 it became unbusinesslike to be working in film and not have a production company in terms of, um, well for one thing, being able to, to deal with large companies like Kodak and um, uh, Samuelson's, um, um, the people from whom you hired equipment, the people with uh, for signing uh, signing agreements that involved outside investors, where <coughs> their companies and seals were going on on projects, and your you know Richard Brennan of Victoria Street, Kings Cross didn't didn't carry the same sort of cachet. I'm not sure what word to use. Uh, I set up. Um, I set up Smiley Films in 1979, and that that was my company until I changed the name to Teralba Films uh, five or six years ago. Now, you also set up, in tandem with uh, some colleagues, a company called Filmside, yeah. which was like a cooperative for producers. Tell us about that, how it was set up, why it came about, and what came out of it. Filmside was intended as really something to get us out of the house. It was uh, Errol Sullivan, uh, Pom Oliver, Ross Matthews and myself found an old building in Woolloomooloo that we could hire for $10,000 a year. Trouble was we had to take a minimum three year lease and I was about to go into production with a feature film called Stir. I was going to get a fee from that would certainly cover my share of, well I was going to get $10,000 I think from it, and that would say, or 15, that was going to cover my two and a half for the year. Question was, could we between us cover $30,000 in a um, three year period? If we couldn't, if we had to stretch and borrow from the banks, we decided it would be a worthwhile exercise and, and let's hope we could find other people who'd come in and share the premises with us. That was never a problem. After um, Stir, Henry Crawford came in and did A Town Like Alice, the then film News took space, um, Russell Boyd, the cameraman, took, some, took up some space, Regular Records took some space. Uh, film after film, television after t uh, television series came through. Because I was, uh, I'd, I'd had this <laughs> peculiar title, investors manage, uh, investment, re investors representative at, at the AFC, which was a little bit like having been the president. You're allowed to keep that. I was, you know, mi well, nobody ever addressed me as Mr. Investors Representative, <laughs> but I remained that after I'd left there. We were able to act as management companies. Um, for films uh, who were looking for 10BA investment and that was very attractive because we could charge a fee of you know one percent or one and a half percent percent of the budget but we we thought that it would be a minor advantage to be able to say to one another you've hired helicopters for harbour shoots is it prohibitively expensive to do it on the weekend or is that you know makeup artist really as expensive as I've been told in fact, it was the fact of being able to consult with one another, draw on one another's knowledge day in and day out, was enormously useful and helpful to us and to the people who who came through there. But there was no structure to that. It wasn't. Oh, no. You weren't a partnership or anything. No, you no, just no. We didn't all have, shared the space. We all shared the space. We were all the directors. Uh, we didn't. <laughs> uh, we didn't have a boss. We took it in turns to collect the rent from one another. Um, and you didn't work on projects together necessarily? I never worked on a project with POM, didn't ever work on a project with Ross and I think worked on two with, with uh, Errol. Errol worked on three or four with POM and one or two with, with uh, Ross. But we did help one another with financing, with recommending and information. Each other to, yeah, recommending each other to brokers and so on. Also an enormous number of people came came through. Al Clark and Andrina Finlay were there for a couple of years. Um, um, I, look, I really lose count. I think 50 or 60 films got made out of film side. And so it was almost like a breeding ground. And but it quite was, unintentionally so. Yes. 
Now that's a model of uh, the best way to, you know, because individual producers, myself included, find it so hard to make a living in the outside world. It's very sad. I think I told you that we, our big worry was could we find 10000 a year each for three years. Well, after 20 years, we were very lucky. The rent had gone up to, uh, it was costing us 50000 but then the building was sold and the, uh, the new owners hiked the rent up by three or four hundred percent. They gave us three months notice and we had to move out and Errol had already mostly shifted over to Southern Star. Ross and I took an office together in Balmain and then he went to the FFC and uh, Pom had long since gone to the UK. But it was great while it lasted.